So welcome back. Um, in the last video, we talked about linear models, uh, both linear regressions, uh, where the x variable is continuous, and, and implicitly uh, in um, one-way ANOVAs, where the x variable is categorical, um, but there's only one categorical variable being considered. Uh, and both of those are cases of, of these kind of univariate linear models uh, and the assumptions we went over. <clears throat> The next thing I want to do is, is to kind of dive into how we actually go about fitting these models in R. Um, and I'll say that a lot of the, the, what I'm talking about here does apply to other statistical software because the models are ultimately the same. I'm going to focus on the R syntax and you know, the, how R organizes the information it gives back to you. So as a reminder, a few, few videos ago we introduced uh, a set of data on soil temperature as our y variable and six hypothesized predictors as our x variables. And what I'm doing at this stage is I'm fitting uh, a linear model to each of those, the, the same y data for all of them and a different x data in each one. Um, and we've looked at these scatter plots before. Um, and what I've done in this version is I've added, um, added the best fitting linear model uh, on top of this. Uh, yes, we're now seeing the best fitting linear model. Now fitting a linear model in R is actually remarkably easy because there is a, a simple function for it called LM. LM stands for linear model, simple. Um, now here's the complicated part. So first the gotcha. Um, in linear models, you write, you write the linear model down in this syntax uh, y tilde x. Now that y tilde x is um, embedding in it kind of uh, a, few, a few assumptions. First is that, that R already knows about all the parameters. Like you don't have to write down the beta 0 plus beta 1 x because it knows that it needs to figure out if, if you give it an x and a y, it knows that there's going to be an, internet, an intercept and a slope. So you don't have to tell it about that. So the, the simplified syntax that uh, R uses for representing models is one where you just focus on what the, the uh, predictor variables are and the response variables. Your response variable is Y, your predictor variables are, are X. As we'll see later, um, when you write down more complicated models, uh, you can have multiple Xs, you know, X1 and X2 and X3 and X4. Uh, and and that when we combine multiple variables, we're going to do so additively, so, you know, x1 plus x2, x plus x3, because again, uh, the, the, the thing that is the key assumption of linear models is that our predictors are, go together additively. The other important gotcha about linear models is that the order here, y tilde x, which makes sense if we're writing down the equation, uh, is the exact opposite of what we do when we make a plot. So when we make a plot, we do x comma y. And now what you're going to find yourself doing a lot of is fitting y tilde x and then plotting x comma y uh, right after it because you want to look at figures like this where you can see the data and then see the regression model. And inevitably, uh, a really common uh, early mistake and, and not uncommon after early is to forget that and to plot, you know, to fit a linear model of y tilde x and then to plot y comma x, and then you've reversed your axes uh, in your plot, or you or you know you you fit a linear model, you know you make a plot x comma y and you make you fit a linear model x tilde y, and now you've again you fit the data in the opposite order to what it you actually think the relationship is, and then when you add the line to the plot, the line doesn't show up on the plot. Uh, because you've reversed the the um, re reverse the relationship. So re just remember when you're writing down linear models in R, you're writing them down the way that you'd write an equation. Uh, and we're, when you're making a plot, you're always saying you're, you're usually going you know x comma y. The other thing that's important to know that's a little bit more complicated is that when you fit a linear model, you usually want to assign that fit. Uh, to a variable. Here I'm calling that variable fit. I can call that variable whatever I want. I could call it Bob. Bob is a linear model of you know y comma y tilde x. And that's because what's returned by linear models isn't a single number, uh, but it's a it's a complicated list of 
other things that are returned. So then that list will be the residuals, the parameters, some error statistics, you know, a whole bunch of things are returned by this function. Uh, and so we want to, rather than just having that all spit to the screen, we want to stick, store it in a variable and then use what comes out of there to do useful things. Okay. Um, and so here we've got our, our lines and we can also, you know, see some patterns and, and see some places uh, that are a little problematic. You know, we can see some of these like TA and wind speed that seem sensible. We see others like soil water content where the, you know, the best fit line seems like it might be already, it seems like it might be violating the assumptions of, of linear models. You know, we have, you know, this, these kind of intermediate value where the best fit line goes between two clouds of data and not through either. Um, it's it maybe, you know, the best fit, but it doesn't really describe what's going on. Um, and clearly, you know, the variance is higher on the low end than it is on the high end. So, you know, that would be worrisome. <clears throat> so in this next slide, I want to kind of dive into how I actually made that series of plots, which is kind of show some handy syntax in R. So I, I was fitting a bunch of different data sets. So I actually set, set this up in a loop. And so I was doing fit a linear model of Y tilde dat, you know, square bracket comma I. And so I was, you know, I was just a variable I was using to indicate which column in the data set I was looking at. So I'm just pulling up a specific column in the data. Uh, and then I made a plot, scatter plot of the data. Um, again, you know, at this point we know how to make scatter plots. Uh, you know, X data, comma, Y data with a title, X label, Y label, etc. cetera. Um, then I'm using this handy function, AB line. AB line, actually uh, is nice for drawing straight lines based on parameters. And in this case, uh, it is, we're, we're literally passing the whole regression object into this AB line function. The AB line function detects that a whole regression object has been passed in and then knows that what we, you know, that what we wanna do is to pull out the slope and the intercept and draw the line. And so, you know, I fit the line, I make a scatter plot of the data, and then I use AB line to draw the line through the data. It should also be note, we'll see AB line later in the semester, because it also has a couple other handy functions. If you say H equals something, it draws a horizontal line, or V equals something, we'll draw a vertical line. Or I can put in A and B explicitly as the intercept and the slope. Um, next up, uh, B equals coef fit. Coef is short for coefficients. Uh, which is another way of saying the parameters. And so that, that line right there is pulling out the intercept and the slope uh, from this fit object. And so that's where I'm actually, you know, B is now got a B1 for the intercept and a B2 for the slope. And then uh, I'm using just the text command uh, to stick uh, literally a, a text string together where I'm pasting together uh, the, the the text y equals with the value b1 plus the value b2x. Uh, and so I'm just making a text string uh, and then I'm sticking that text screen somewhere specifically on the plot. Doesn't really matter where. You know, here's the x coordinate and the y coordinate. I'm just, yeah, plot. So that's how I'm adding the words for this equation on the, on the plot. And you, there's more sophisticated things you could do to like, you know, show just a certain number of significant digits on that. But, you know, again, this is just a simple way of making a plot. And again, I that emphasizes the AB line fit and the, the B coefficients. Okay. So in, in addition to, to, you know, adding the line to the plot, one of the other things that we want to do with statistical models is look at the actual uh, numbers coming out of them in terms of, you know, uh, what were the, the statistics underlying this model. <clears throat> and so a handy function for that is the summary function. And if you remember from, you know, uh, lab one, the summary function, if you just give it data, we'll give you basic summary statistics of the data. But if you give it a, a regression object, it'll give you some really important summary statistics about that regression. So I'm going to walk through this in detail um, because you're going to see a lot of these. So first, what it tells you, call LM formula, blah, blah, blah. 
So this is just a reminder to tell you what you passed into this model. So that when you're looking, if you fit a bunch of models, you can go back and see what you did for each of them. Um, next, this residuals line. So this is giving me some simple statistics about uh, the residuals. And they're ones that we could, you know, we know how to calculate uh, by themselves, but they're just a handy reminder. So the minimum come from the min function, the maximum come from the max function, the median coming from the median function, uh, and the first and third quartile coming from the quantiles functions. So that's the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. Uh, should be noted that, that one of the things you would think would be here would be the mean. Uh, and I'll say the, you know, the reason that you don't have the mean here is that the mean error in a regression is always zero because you're always finding uh, the line that causes the mean error to be zero. Uh, so that's kind of built into how linear regression works is, is it always finds a, a line that is, is unbiased. So the, the mean error is zero. Um, the fact here that the mean and the median are a little bit different implies that the errors might not be uh, perfectly normal, but in this case, it's not really that different from normal given the overall spread. And likewise, you know, the, the, the first and third quartile are not that different, which again indicates that the spread actually might be kind of symmetric. Um, and, but we do see the minimum and maximum are, are, are actually quite a bit farther out than the, the, the quartiles in the worst, you know, in the worst ca case, our predictions can be off by, you know, you know, over 13 degrees Celsius. So that's a pretty huge error. But, you know, most of the time we see errors in the range of, of you know, a couple degrees. So they're in their quartile range. Okay, next, this coefficient section. So this is really the meat of what we're doing here because this is telling us, you know, the numbers for the, the best fit of the line. So first, uh, there's gonna be a, a table here where each row represents one parameter in your model. And so in this case, we had a two parameter model that an intercept and the slope. So the intercept is given by the intercept line. Uh, the slope is given by the name of whatever the, co the covariate was. So in this case, we passed dat com comma i in as our x variable. So, you know, dat comma i is, is the name here. If I had passed, you know, this in explicitly by name and said, you know, y tilde, um, air temperature plus, you know, uh, wind speed plus, uh, you know, vapor pressure deficit, then I would have had, you know, you know, wind speed, you know, air, te uh, air temperature and uh, vapor pressure deficit as the names of these rows. And again, they're describing the slope associated with each of those variables. Uh, the estimate column is you know, the, the, the mean estimate of that parameter, the best fit estimate of that parameter. Uh, and so the best fit of the intercept is, you know, 4.5 degrees. The best estimate of the slope is uh, you know, about 0.6 degrees. And so that is telling us, you know, really, if we want to describe that line, the key things we need to know, the slope and the intercept. Uh, the rest of this is telling us about uh, first the uncertainty. So the next thing it's telling about is the uncertainties. So because we're fitting this line to a finite amount of data, uh, there is going to be uncertainty about what the best fitting uh, s slope and intercept actually are. So there's, uh, like again, we're going to use probability to represent uncertainty. So there's some probability distribution for the intercept and some probability distribution for the slope as well as a covariance between the two. Um, and so this standard error is Again, the, the uncertainty, the standard deviation of the distribution of the, uh, the best fit value of those parameters. So remember, we talked a few lectures about, back about you know, standard deviations describe distributions and standard errors tell us about the uncertainties in, in individual parameters. Uh, the T value here is just representing um, how many standard errors, uh, your estimate is away from uh, some particular hypothesis, hypothesized value. And so in this case, uh, the default hypothesis built, the default null hypothesis, I should say that, the default null hypothesis 
uh, built into linear regression is that the slope is zero and the intercept is zero. Uh, and so this t statistic is being calculated from the mean and the standard error. And we're seeing that uh, this intercept is 164 standard errors away from zero, and the slope is 247 standard errors away from zero. And if you remember from your intro stats class that you know our 95% confidence interval is about two standard errors, uh, and so you know these are th these slopes and intercepts are really really far away uh, from those hypothesized values. And so from that error distribution, which actually you know I won't go into it now, but uh, because there's uncertainty in the in the parameter and in the standard error, the 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 um, these actually, the, the estimates actually follow a T distribution rather than a, a normal distribution. And so uh, we use the, the T distribution to calculate uh, a P value. And so the P value uh, is given here and it's actually given as just less than two to the minus 16th, two times 10 to the minus 16th. That's what the E stands for. Uh, which are you know highly significant values. Essentially, it doesn't calculate the true significance because it's it's extremely small. Um, and then another thing that hand, that R does that's handy is they use these significance codes here to help you flag uh, values just to make it easy. So if there's nothing uh, next to a p value, that, that means the p value is between uh, one and 0.1. If there is a single dot, it means the p-value is between 0.1 and 0.5. If there's one asterisk, it's between 0.5 and 0.05 and 0.01. Uh, two asterisks means it's between 0.01 and 0.001. And uh, three asterisks means it's between 0.001 and zero. And so this three asterisks means, you know, this is you know a, a highly significant uh, estimate of those parameters. Want to also note here because it's going to be important is to remember uh, that statistical significance and you know scientifically meaningful are not necessarily always the same thing. Uh, particularly when you deal with high volumes of data, you can get things that are statistically significant but are actually uh, pretty trivial in their effect size um, and not really necessarily meaningful. Uh, likewise, if you don't if you're short on data, you don't have much power. You know, you could have things that are, are definitively important but are not statistically significant yet because you lack the power to detect them. Um, so, you know, in many ways, uh, yeah, again, p values are not a reflection of effect size. They're not a reflection of whether something is actually true or not. Uh, they're a reflection of given the data that we have so far, can we, you know, uh, you know what's the probability of, of related to refuting the null hypothesis? And in fact, uh, later in the semester, I will dive more deeply into the actual true definition of what a p-value is, and it's one of these convoluted tongue twisters about the pro if you were to repeat this experiment uh, an infinite number of times, how often would you get a value uh, as extreme as this one or more extreme? So it's, it's a bit of a tongue twister of a definition, and, and uh, there's a lot uh, to be said about t treating p-values with caution and not over-interpreting and not misinterpreting them. But they still are a, a, a something that's frequently used in the literature, um, and uh, thus you know useful to know how R generates them and useful to know how to interpret them. Uh, again, I'll also say that the the statistics that come out on these tests are statistics that were designed for a single test. And again, I said this earlier. Uh, once you start doing multiple tests, uh, these Error rates are not actually the ones that are that are that are true because these are these error rates are assuming you only fit one model. Once you fit two models or three models or four models, uh, your rate of fault, false positives is going to go up. So again, if I fit twenty models, you know even you know one of them is likely to be statistically significant just by chance. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So the, the bottom block here now tells us about the error statistics. So this, this coefficients block tells us about the slope and intercepts. This last block of text is telling us about the residual error. Uh, so first, the residual standard error, 
is 3.107, so that's the, the root mean squared error, the thing we were trying to minimize. Um, uh, on 14,115 degrees of freedom. And again, uh, degrees of freedom is related to the number of observations and the number of uh, parameters that need to be estimated. So it's, it's essentially, we know we're estimating two parameters. So, you know, it's telling us that, that there, you know, there was, you know, about 14,000 data points used to estimate uh, these parameters. And it also is explicitly telling us that it dropped uh, 3,403 observations due to missingness, which basically means it detected NAs in either the X or the Y for, you know, over 3,000 data points. So there was, you know, we started with what looked like 17,000 observations. Uh, in this case, it was half hourly data for a full year. That's about 17,000 half hours in a year. Um, and th there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of missing data, but in the grand scheme of things, more than enough data was present to fit things. Uh, next, we get um, the R squared. We haven't talked about R squared explicitly in this class yet. Um, hopefully, you've seen that in previous courses. We'll talk about it more later. But you know, essentially, it's a, it's a goodness of fit measure. And it's really essentially saying, uh, what proportion of the variability in my Y data is explained by this model? And so it's saying that this model explains about 81% of the variability in the Y uh, in the Y data, which means there's about 19% of the variability that's not explained, that's attributed to the residuals. Uh, the adjusted R square is something that we won't focus much on because it's a way of uh, uh, kind of adjusting the R squared for the number of parameters, and some people use that for model selection. We'll talk about other approaches to model selection uh, later. Um, and then the last thing we see is this F statistic, uh, which, you know, um, the, F, the, the t tests in the coefficient sections are, are testing a hypothesis about the intercept, testing a hypothesis about the slope, and it's testing those two things independently. The F statistic is a test on the overall model. So it's kind of testing the significance of the overall model relative to the null model. And so we get um, you know, a, a, a very large F statistic uh, associated with uh, one degree of free freedom from the model, 14,000 degrees of freedom from the residuals, and giving us, again, a very highly significantly significant p-value. Uh, if we want to, oh, and I also want to point out that uh, the intercept and slope uh, in the um, linear model are not independent of each other. They, they're correlated, and so uh, if we want to find out not just the standard errors of these two things, but also their covariance, we can use this v-cov function to get the covariance between uh, the slope and the intercept. We won't do this a lot, but it'll come. It'll become important anytime we're making predictions with linear models. Oh, so the last thing that was on the bottom of that row uh, was that information about the overall test uh, of of the model, and I want to point out that if you pass the fit from a regression model uh, to the ANOVA function in R, uh, that will give you back the ANOVA table. And so the ANOVA function in R doesn't fit an ANOVA. It just gives you the ANOVA table. You use the LM to fit an ANOVA. You use the LM to fit a regression, again, because LM stands for linear model, and both those things are linear models. Uh, but the ANOVA table can be handy. Uh, to kind of breaking down that that F test because it tells you, uh, you know, for for the data for the model, you know, how many degrees of freedom were there? You know, one degree of freedom for the model, uh, fourteen thousand degrees of freedom for the residuals. What the sum of squared errors were for the um, model versus the residual. Um, what the mean squared error is for each of those. So it takes the sum of squared errors and divides them by the degrees of freedom. Uh, and then it calculates the ratio of those two things to get this F statistic. And then it uses the F distribution, which is a probability distribution, uh, to calculate the, the p-value. So this is the full breakdown of the ANOVA table. If you've done an ANOVA in, in, uh, in your intro stats course, you would have seen ANOVA tables before. 
I will say that I, I will not emphasize ANOVAs in this class because again, they're just special cases of linear models where your X's have to be, happen to be categorical variables. I will also say that uh, when we, if, I go, if I go back and look at the example we're using here with these six different uh, covariates that we're using to predict soil temperature, uh, all had highly significant univariate regressions with p-values all less than, uh, you know, all, all in this high, highly significant range. So at this point, we have not actually rejected any of those univariate models. Uh, all of them are viable. So even the ones that don't look great uh, are coming back uh, as statistically significant. Again, I haven't looked yet at the r squareds of them to know how much variability they're explaining. Uh, I do know there's a few that are suspicious in terms of they might be violating the assumption. But in terms of uh, even the ones that are violating assumptions, you would argue are doing a better job of explaining the data than the null model, which is the mean is zero and there's no slope. And again, that's not necessarily a, a not always a useful thing. And so when we get to the model selection part of this lecture, I'll emphasize that you know, our traditional null model can often be so incredibly trivial that it's not really you know, you get these really significant p-values, but it doesn't really mean much because you're comparing it to uh, an assumption that is is so trivial uh, in many cases um, that it's often more useful to compare competing models to each other rather than to compare them just to a null model. Cool. So I'm going to wrap this up here, and then I'll pick up uh, next video on talking about multiple regression.